Okay, welcome. Um, so I'm going to talk about swap, swear, and swindle, which um, many of you might already know from our um, early orange papers on um, the incentive structure for content distribution and content storage. But it has evolved quite considerably since then to be a, a framework for incentivizing all kinds of distributed services, as Victor was alluding to. And I'm going to go through the story of how this platform developed. So I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about our checkbook payment contract, which grew from a very simple micropayment contract into the more complete platform um, that we're, well, we're building. It's not finished yet, but where do I? Where do I target this? Turn it on. OK, that's better. Um, OK, so well, we don't, I'll, this is sort of our outline of the paper. I'm going to start with SWAP, which is the peer-to-peer -peer accounting protocol. Um, so SWAP um, is uh, the protocol by which nodes keep track of the services provided and consumed. And in a decentralized system, the, you have to have a per-peer accounting of everything you do, and, and ev everything is, is on a per-connection basis because, of course, there's no central providers. So nodes keep track of the services uh, consumed for every peer. Um, and I gave the following example in our Swarm update on the main stage. I said the basic first use case of Swarm supplying app data in a decentralized way would work as follows. You type in a Swarm address in your URL bar, and that would be resolved by ENS into a content hash. And that's the only thing we need the blockchain for, in, for data provision, because once we have the hash, we can queer, uh, query our peers for that data and be sure that we're going to get the correct data. And then step four was, I said, you receive the data from the peers and you compensate them accordingly. And in this compensate them accordingly, that's where the entire payment infrastructure was hidden. So I'm going to talk about that. And of course, step five was render the DAP. So how does it work under the hood? A, no a node, so I always have these two nodes today. It's node one and node two. They halfway through the slides, they turn into node A and node B. Don't know how that happened. So node two requests data and it gets delivered. Um, and instead of paying for every chunk, because that would make a very unusable protocol, you actually allow a bit of leeway and you have a more data. But after a certain while, uh, if too much service gets consumed, um, node two would have to pay node A in some sense. And I said it pays by sending a check using our checkbook contract. This is an off-chain payment, and I'll get more, I'll talk a lot more about that, to sort of balance out the consumption. So if node one and node two consume services from each other and it's balanced, you never actually need payment. So it's not always service for payment, it could be a service for service exchange and the swap takes into account all of these um, scenarios. So internally, this is a representation of what a swap channel might look like. Um, when we start, we're here. Neither node owes any node anything. And as one node consumes services, our internal balance tilts towards the side. And within, within this range, we're happy to move back and forth. If we move too far to one side, we have to initiate a payment. So this is our current status. If node two consumes more data, we'll end up here. And at that point, it has to pay to get us back to sort of the balanced channel state. Um, if we go too far to the side, we disconnect. That's the penalty. Um, so how does this basic checkbook work? Um, you have a swarm node. It has a checkbook contract deployed. And this checkbook contract has some balance. Now at this point, node one can pay node two by issuing a check. So it writes a check, referencing its checkbook contract, an amount, here it's one ether. And um, at this point, node two has the option of cashing in that check. So cashing in the check means sending that check to the, bl to the blockchain, to that contract, and that contract will send one ether to node B, or node two. Um, the alternative is not to cash the check, right? We're trying to save on transaction costs. And the trick here is that the check payments from node one to node two are cumulative. So you can keep collecting more and more checks. And um, each new check uh, kind of makes the previous one unnecessary. And you only ever have to cash the last one. So how that works is 
um, the first check was for one ether, and the second check, if node uh, one wants to pay another two, it would issue a check which has a total of three on it, and if one then wants to pay another seven, it would issue a check, not one that says seven, but one that says 10. And uh, when node two caches checks, well, let's assume we've already cached the first check, um, and so the contract remembers how much node one has already cached, node two has cached, so when it sends in a supplementary check, it gets paid the difference. So in that sense, uh, you can only ever, you'd only ever need to cash the last check. So what do I have? If A wants to send B another three ether, creates a check with a total of 13, which when cashed, initiates a payment of three. So what that means is that node B really has the option of, pay, of cashing checks anytime. They give immediate on-chain payments, but B can choose how frequently to cash checks. So maybe if we're new in business, I might cash your checks frequently, but if we have a connection and share data for m months on end, after a while, I might just cash them once a day or once a week. It's really a matter of trust. So the more often I cash them, the higher my security guarantees, but also the higher my costs are. So, but that's up to me. Yeah, so a section on negative checks. So we want to extend this checkbook, perhaps, um, in the following scenario, what can happen if we have a swap channel that has a lot of variance, so it tilts one way and then it tilts the other way a lot, we end up getting uh, uncashed checks accumulating on both sides. And it would really be nice if we could sort of um, play them off against each other. So in this case, I have on my slide here an 18 here and a five there, but as well, in our, I'm continuing my example, we've already cached 13. So what this represents is both nodes owe each other five. And so why can't we just cancel that out instead of having to do two on-chain payments? So that's what this sort of negative uh, checks idea is about. We want to avoid this situation. Um, so we extend the checkbook in the following way. Uh, the checks now have a serial number. So you see check number four from A to B has the 13 ether total. Um, and the checkbook remembers not just how much was cached, but what the last check uh, serial number that was cached was. So now, um, another change is that caching checks is no longer instantaneous. We need a security delay, which is not surprising. If you, any work on the payment channels always has these security delays. Um, so node B holds a check worth 13, so it means it can get paid out another three. And now suppose the channel goes the other way and node B needs to pay node A 1.5 ether. Uh, it can create a check. That was the old method, send a check worth 1.5. Or what it can do is it can take this check number four, supersede it with a check number five, so it's got serial number five, with a new total of 11.5 ether. So it's reduced its total. So uh, uh, it can cash that check whenever it would like, still works, and you know, get the 1.5 difference. And if node B tries to cheat, by sending in the earlier check, well, that's where the security delay comes in. Node A would send the check which is signed by B to show, no, that's not correct. And the serial number keeps track of which one is the newest one. So uh, this method allows us to do a lot of business, accumulating a bunch of uncashed checks, some serial number and some total. And then if the balance goes the other way, we can in go, keep going, keep going, keep going until all this balance is used up and we're effectively back at zero. And we can do all of that without ever cashing a check. So, so, you can, so that's, that's, that's really useful for doing repeated payments off chain. And yeah, and only once we've hit zero here do we ever have to send checks the other way. So they accumulate on one side and then deaccumulate and then maybe accumulate on the other and deaccumulate. But sort of this going goes back and forth and we're trying to avoid ever using the blockchain or as, as use it as little as possible. Yeah, the benefits are we can reduce the transaction costs much more than just the simple payment contract, the single checkbook. Um, and yes, it's better suited for high variance swap channels because it's high variance where you have the checks piling up. And this might actually be a common use case. Like when you are running a swarm node, you're continually providing little bits of data to your peers and then you sit down and watch a movie and that's when you really you know, use up a lot of bandwidth. So this kind of high variance is actually as we're assuming it's going to be typical. Um, yeah, and this method can be further extended to support payment channels. Now, what do I mean by that? 
So payment channels are a little bit different than checkbook, and the difference is in terms of security. So let me talk about the security of checkbook payments. How secure is a check? Um, well, the answer is they're not really secure. And I mean, the, the sort of baby example is the following. A has a checkbook with 100 on it, sends B a check worth one. B is happy, I can cash this check whenever I want. A creates a check to itself, pays out the full 100. B tries to cash the check, and there is no collateral left, right? It's pooled, the, the 100 here was pooled over all the outstanding checks that A has issued, and we have no idea what those checks are. They could be, you know, I mean, it, to be fair, there, there's more to be said here because if these checkbooks are long running and you can see over you know, the past month, past year, past five years that Node A has issued checks and honored all of them, you've got an on-chain credit history of Node A and if it ever issues checks that are not covered, um, you know, that would be visible for all future. So it, 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 the, the security is more implicit based on you know, credit history and trust, but it's not hard-coded into any smart contract. So suppose we wanted more hard guarantees, so we have the same guarantees as a payment channel. That would work as follows. Instead of having one collateral for all outstanding checks, the checkbook has subtotals of that reserved for certain peers. So I'd have 100 for all my outstanding checks, but locked for B is 30, locked for C is 10, and locked for D is 3, meaning that B can be sure that any checks they hold will be honored up to and including 30. Because whenever somebody tries to take you know, more than, well, suppose you want to empty node A's checkbook and there's an outgoing transaction for 100, at that point node B can say, no, I still have this check, hand it in, and they take, they have pre pre take precedent. So um, that's a security guarantee. And uh, if we also use this method of checks going up and down in balance, you can see that this is already functionally equivalent to a payment channel. Well, it's only half a payment channel because it starts out with only payments from A to B. Um, but um, if we have one of these on both sides, A and B have checkbooks uh, with amounts locked for each other, then this is functionally equivalent to a payment channel. Um, right, what did I want to say? Oh yeah, so a bit of nomenclature. We're calling this the in our upcoming paper, we're writing all of these up, this payment infrastructure, so this is called a channel deposit. Actually, we're calling this a hard channel deposit because there's a twist to this where we can have something else called soft channel deposits that I want to talk about very briefly. So suppose we have collateral that's pooled over several names. So we might have uh, B has a 30 ether locked with it as beneficiary, but we could all say, well, C and D together have a guarantee of 13. and um, how much of that is actually for C and how much of that is actually for D can change with time. And the idea we want to do is we want to rebalance payment channels off-chain, right? Right now, payment channels are great for repeated payments, but if one channel is depleted and another one fills up, you need on-chain payments to rebalance. And this is a scheme to try to even do that rebalancing without ever needing to go on-chain. And it works as long as your families of payment channels are small you have a few peers, but within a swarm network, there's a limited number of peers with which you do repeated business. So as long as nodes A, the checkbook owner, and the beneficiary, C and D, agree on how much of that soft channel deposit covers the each checks, then we're good. So maybe we start out with C having 3F guaranteed and wait, wait, 10 for C and 3 for D. Um, and then to change that, A would send a message saying, okay, from the next epoch, and there's epochs, sort of a time period. So in the next epoch, we want to change this so that now seven are guaranteed for C, and six are guaranteed for D, and that message is signed by A. That's not yet enough, because C and D have to agree as well. You know, as long as there's consensus within that small group of peers, they can rebalance, yeah, they can rebalance their payment channels without ever going on chain. So with those ingredients, we believe that this checkbook uh, infrastructure really does allow for a network of payment channels with rebalancing without ever really needing to go on chain or very, very rarely. So it's good for a lot of repeated microtransactions. And this rebalancing, by the way, is important because of variance. So if we expect a lot of uh, payments to flow in one way, we might need to increase the guarantees for one peer and then later as it flows the other way, we can decrease that guarantee, increase another and all of these kind of games we want to play without needing to go on the blockchain. 
So yeah, it requires consensus from all the named parties to function securely. Um, and if every, any one of those peers drops offline, well, then you, then you need to go on chain to start a new cycle with a new set of peers, probably. But the details of that are um, still being written up. It's all a question of how to reach consensus amongst your peers on what everyone's uh, guarantee is. Um, right, um, at some point I can, all right. Um, I, so this, this idea of um, the checkbook that I've introduced so far is going to be the basis for a much wider range of payments. Um, so it's not just about storage and data retrieval. We want to, you know, we want to enable peer-to-peer -peer services of many different types, as already mentioned, and we want it to fit into the same infrastructure. So the checkbook is really easily extendable to allow different kinds of payments, different kinds of financial instruments. So for, I'm got, just going to list a few examples. Um, promissory notes and bonds, they work just like checks that can be cashed at a future time. So they have a valid from and valid until date. That means only during that time can they be cashed. And again, they don't really have to be cashed at that time as long as you, they're subsumed within some swap messages. But so bonds works. Recurring payments as well, a recurring payment, if I, pay you, if I give you a check with the rule that you can cash it once a week for the next five months, then that's a recurring payment. And again, it doesn't have to go on chain as long as within a swap channel, both parties agree that a payment happened, it happened. Um, bounties, yes, bounties um, are called conditional bonds or conditional checks. So I can issue you a check that you cannot cash unless some other condition is met. And that condition is separate to this game, like it, it's, you get, there's a little hook in the check which says evaluate some third contract which tells you whether the condition happened, yes or no. So maybe that condition is an oracle of telling you whether some GitHub issue had been closed with you as a author of a PR, whatever it is, and then that cash can be checked. So bounties work in this case, loans as well. I can agree to reduce the swap balance between us, effectively loaning you something in exchange for a check that is only valid in future, which is the repayment. Um, yeah, so it's very flexible. And there's many other checks, many other forms we can, uh, we can imagine um, including. And so even the Swarm's long-term storage requests, this is kind of where we started developing these ideas. They fit into this framework. Long-term storage is a payment that you can only unlock by um, giving repeated proofs of custody. The proof of custody is the condition, saying you still have the data, and that gives you the payment. Um, and it also just takes the form of a conditional check. Um, yeah, in our upcoming paper, we have an overview of the kind of things you can do, bounties, deposits, conditional loans. Um, it's very flexible. Um, and uh, well, we're still writing it all up, but it's, it's coming soon. Um, briefly, swear. What is swear in this context? Swear is a contract where you can tie up collateral to promise that you're going to behave well according to certain service provisions and be penalized if you don't. It's also a registration to indicate what services you want to offer. You can register yourself with a storage service, register yourself with, I don't know, some database provision service. So Swear handles the registrations. Um, and uh, yeah, so the, the, the swear contract, tell this, the registrations tell the swap contracts what kind of conditional bonds are allowed within this swap channel. And it's supposed to be really flexible. So I could choose to be just a relaying node, I could choose to be a storing node, I could choose to be any other node. And the only w change it, uh, changes I'd have to do is register with the appropriate swear contract and then the swap channels are now allowing payments of that type, conditional checks of that type. Um, and the other ingredient, swindle. Um, swindle. The swindle contracts are the enforcers of these, these contracts. So you register with swear, and swindle is really the logic. It's the evaluating the conditions of the conditional payments. So well, swear tells us what kind of services we're offering uh, and what kind of conditional bonds we accept, swindle allows us to enforce those conditions. So again, the original example was long-term storage. The swindle contract evaluates the proof of custody. Do I really still have the data? or uh, you know, punishes me if I don't. And to be fair, the swindle contract doesn't actually do this. The swindle contract only handles the logic of accusing someone, evaluating uh, an accusation and handling accordingly, and the contract that handles the proof of custody is a, is a, is a sort of hook in to the swindle system. The swindle system is just the court system itself. 
Um, right, and so this is sort of a little bit of an overview of the interaction between the three contracts. Um, you know, the swindle contract is the is a judge um, of, of trying to evaluate whether something happened. Um, it in return can cause sentencing. It can cause swears collateral to be burned. That's you know the original example. Um, it handles the verification of notes. This is where I said you know like proof of custody would be on this level. Uh, conditional bonds uh, evaluated by swindle, and yeah, commitments to services, security deposits. So this is these three sort of interact nicely, and they're extensible. Uh, extendable. That's 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 really important. So any time you can define on chain what it means to provide a service, if you can write a contract that can understand, that can give you a yes or no answer, whether a service was provided, um, then it can be tied into this payment infrastructure. And oracles, of course, are really important down here. Plugging in an oracle that tells you whether something happened uh, allows you to make conditional payments based on that oracle, and it should fit in really smoothly on our, on our infrastructure. So we're writing all that up. Um, that's upcoming. It's uh, work in progress. And um, do you want to say a few words? Come on. Thanks. So just a few things to, to complement what Aaron said so far. <coughs> so the whole context of this software and swindle games is, of course, to have uh, proper service networks over, over a large number of nodes. So the idea is, here is that the, the security of these swap channels is, is uh, really um, based on the idea that the, the nodes that um, set up a swap channel between themselves uh, engage in repeated uh, dealings. So, so because, because of the, 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 the accumulated micropayments is, is, is what allows us to to uh, hold out, uh, for example, you know, on-chain um, caching of checks, and and that's why it's 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 really important that that the the the, the nodes that engage in in, in swap channel uh, dealings have have a, a recurring uh, interaction with each other. However, the, the whole point of 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 this is is that if you have a uh, a Kademlia uh, topology of, of of nodes, like a, a proper um, graph where where you can guarantee that each node is reachable from from every other node, then you can extend the service interactions between peers in in two ways. First of all, you can extend them in in terms of frequency. So you can have uh, one-off ad hoc transactions between peers instead of repeated dealings uh, because you can, uh, you, can, uh, you can have indirect transactions which um, go through like individual hops which correspond to the swap channels. And also, not in ter so in terms of um, ad, ho ad hoc and one-off payments and also in terms of uh, you know and in terms of any node like any two nodes can interact it's not not just your your direct peers and the whole point is that s with, with 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 such a uh, kademlia topology each node is connected to a to like a, a small um, constant set of of nodes at any one time so the so the the their, their interactions and 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 uh, they, they, they're having c contracts with each other is kind of feasible and at the same time the it, it allows if, if you combine them into uh, into this uh, swap channel networks uh, then you can guarantee that uh, any two nodes can interact with each other in, in like even even an ad hoc one-off fashion and and so so one one example of this is that uh, when for example Payments uh, between nodes can be extended to to any two nodes uh, based on these hops, which is basically a lightning network or a Raiden style network, um, um, which which can fall, falls out from, from this paradigm. Uh, the other the other important thing that I would like to talk about is is that uh, such service networks allow 
a zero cost entry to a, to a, to, to a, to a service because uh, the moment you can uh, you, you are allowed to pr provide service to 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 your peers uh, the, the the peer can basically commit to uh, pay you uh, by creating uh, the checkbook contract for you uh, in w w once once uh, they 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 consumed enough service so that uh, you know that your your service covers the cost of 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 creating a, a, a contract and so so basically uh, nodes can bootstrap themselves in such a service system um, without having any ether balance and that's that's a quite uh, nice property because you can have you can have an entry point to the to the ecosystem without going through exchanges and all kinds of things which is is, is usually quite a st serious bottleneck to, to a lot of people um, especially those who have um, problems with like banking services in their country or region. Um, so, so one one important thing is 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 the, is the service network extension of this software and swindle games, and maybe maybe the other aspect that I need to mention is that um, is how the how the swindle contract works. So, as 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 Aaron mentioned. The, the idea is that the swingle contract is just a generic uh, uh, contract that knows how to orchestrate a trial, basically knows how to conduct a trial. We, we chose to uh, mm, conceptualize this as a, as, a, as a finite state automaton, because the, where, where in the finite state automaton, the, the, the states correspond to stages of a trial, for example, that a trial is in the phase of evaluating uh, the, the, the first accusation and, uh, and cause a witness contract that testifies to, to a particular evidence that's submitted to a contract. This abstraction allows for uh, like s s mm, quite, quite a varied types of uh, evidence uh, to be evaluated by the contracts. And at the same time, keeps keeps the the logic of the of the flow of the trial quite uh, quite succinct and quite easy to argue about. And so the the, the as as the finite state automaton uh, is 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 progressing. So in in one stage, it it causes a witness contract, and 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 according to the to the testimony of that contract, whether the evidence is uh, is confirms the accusation or or refutes that it, it progresses the trial in the next stage and 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 the end of the trial the the end state of the automaton is of course the guilty or non guilty verdict that uh, we, we, with the help of which the execution is given back to the swear contract which can then confiscate the 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 deposit the collateral that um, that uh, that un underpins your your promise to to com comply with the with the service provision um, conditions. So um, so with with this with this um, uh, intricate interaction between the three contracts, basically the the hope is that we provide a, a, a base layer infrastructure for supporting all kinds of service economies, uh, most notably. Uh, incentivization in terms of uh, re rewards on the one hand, so positive incentivization for actual services provided, and on the other hand, service guarantees, so if so, to, so guarantees to, to service consumers that if certain uh, promises of, the, of, a, of a continuing uh, service provision are not met, then, uh, then you can have individual uh, punitive measures um, uh, enforced on on the on the on the service providers, which gives uh, very strong guarantees. Usually, that 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 service is 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 um, yeah, provided properly as, as an emergent property of these networks. So um, this is this is it basically. So thank you for your attention. <laughs>